Rounds up three notes, and we're going to talk now about reacting acids and bases. So back in concept one notes, I started off by introducing you to a neutralization reaction or an acid-base reaction. Gave you a very brief overview of that definition. Well, now we're going to dive into this deeper. Okay, so an acid-base reaction, like we said, is a type of double replacement reaction where an acid and a base react to form water and salt. Now, this doesn't always make water and salt, but it usually does. And for your purposes in this class, that's what you're going to see as well. So a reminder, a salt is an ionic compound made from the cation of a base and an anion from an acid. Here was an example equation we saw, and I kind of color-coded this, where you have your hydrochloric acid, um, your sodium hydroxide, and it's going to make water and salt. And here's a picture of what that kind of looks like. And we can also say that an acid-base reaction is known as a neutralization reaction because the properties of both the acid and the base are neutralized when they react. And the nice thing about this is you can bring in stoichiometry if you want to figure out, you know, if I have this much acid, how much base do I need to neutralize that? And you can do some calculations there, which we love to see. We love to do that math. Okay. Let's talk about what we will see with different types of acid-based reactions. So back in concept two, we talked about how you can qualitatively describe acids and bases as strong versus weak. And what we see is we see different kinds of things happen in the reaction of a strong acid and a strong base versus a strong acid and a weak base or a weak acid and a strong base. So we're going to look at that here and I'll give you examples of each one. So an example of a strong acid and a strong base is this equation we've looked at several times here before. I will keep color coding the strong acids red, strong bases blue, and then we've got our water and our salt. So strong acids, they completely ionize. Strong bases completely dissociate. The reaction goes to completion. You don't have any hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide left. You just have the water and the salt. That's what we would see with a strong and a strong. Now, a strong acid with a weak base. So I used a little bit of a different shade of blue here to represent that base. Here's an example here with HBr and aluminum hydroxide making aluminum bromide and water. So what we see is that HBr will completely ionize because it's a strong acid, but the aluminum hydroxide, it would fully dissociate if it dissolved, but it's insoluble. So it doesn't make as many hydroxide ions as it could. So there's still going to be some aluminum hydroxide left here in the products here. The reaction will go to completion. It will happen. Um, the reactants will combine to form the maximum possible amount of product. They'll use up their entire limiting reactant, but we're still going to have that aluminum hydroxide hanging out. Okay? We see something similar with a weak acid and a strong base reaction. So a weak acid is like acetic acid. It reacts with a strong base like sodium hydroxide. We get sodium acetate and water. So only a small percent of the acetic acid will actually ionize because it's not crazy polar. And um, the NaOH, though, will completely dissociate because it's a strong base. We'll see this reaction go to completion, but we'll definitely have some of this acetic acid remaining in the solution. And then lastly, we see a weak acid and a weak base. This is actually an uncommon reaction because neither really has a strong desire to transfer, um, you know, a hydrogen ion or receive that hydrogen ion. So this will not go to completion and you're not really going to see this ever happen in our class. Um, okay, now let's talk about buffers because this is a really important application for acid and base reactions. So a buffer is a solution that resists changes in pH when moderate amounts of acids or bases are added. So you'll have a buffer and it will stabilize the pH in acid and base reactions. And it won't keep it the exact same, like it won't keep the pH 6 per se, but it will keep it within a range of maybe like 5.5 to 6.5, that kind of thing. And buffers are so important biologically. There are so many biological buffers and they do a lot of things in your body. Um, blood is like the most common popular example of this, but let's keep talking about what a buffer is. So you make a buffer using a weak acid and its corresponding salt or a weak base and its corresponding salt. Okay, let's look at an example. So let's look at ammonia, which is a weak base. A corresponding salt to ammonia is ammonium chloride. Okay, so here's what would happen if I added a strong acid to 
this buffer. Well, a strong acid will completely dissociate and add a ton of hydrogen ions to the solution. So what we would see happen is this ammonia would react with those hydrogen ions. It would take those up and make mo more of this ammonium ion, okay? Now, let's see, if we add a strong base, what would happen? Well, a strong base is gonna put off hydroxide ions. Well, who's gonna scoop that up? Well, this salt is gonna dissociate in, er, to its ions. So the ammonium ion is gonna pick up that hydroxide and it's gonna, well, it's gonna, well, the hydroxide, excuse me, is gonna pull a hydrogen off the ammonium ion and it's gonna make that ammonia and that water and it's gonna reset us back to zero. So this kind of show, well, not reset back to zero, but reset back to our stabilization. And so this kind of shows you how both the weak base and its salt work together to counteract when hydrogens are added from a strong acid and when hydroxides are added from a strong base to keep us stable. Okay, now let's look at a different example. Let's look at a weak acid and its corresponding salt. Okay, so sodium acetate is a corresponding salt to acetic acid. So if you add a strong acid, that's going to add hydrogens. Okay, so remember this salt dissociates. So this, the acetate ion from this salt is going to take up that hydrogen and we're going to get more of our weak acid formed. If you add a strong base, that's going to add hydroxide ions here. Well, that hydroxide ion is going to pull the hydrogen off our weak acid, make more of the acetate ion that goes in our salt, and then it's going to make more water. So that's where we kind of have these counteracting each other. Okay, so... That is what we see with these buffers. An example of this, like I said, is blood. Your blood pH is 7.4, but it kind of ranges anywhere from 7.35 to 7.45. That's considered normal. Anything above 7.8 or below 6.8, you would literally die. So it's a very tiny, tiny margin. And so what we see in your blood is when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it makes carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid and the ion HCO3 minus, they work together. They're going to counteract. So if I add hydroxide ions, the carbonic acid will react with that. The hydroxide ion will pull the hydrogen off the carbonic acid, make more of that HCO3 minus. If I add hydrogen ions, that HCO3 minus will take up that hydrogen, make more carbonic acid and vice versa. So that's how it's kind of working together to stabilize. We will be researching some buffers in class to give you some more context for this. Okay, I mentioned indicators in our last unit when we talked about like how you may have used indicators before when you are testing the pH of a pool or something like that. But an indicator is just an acid or a base and it changes color as it gains or loses hydrogen atoms. And most have a really specific pH range in which they change colors. So for example, phenol red is an indicator. Um, it's yellow at a neutral pH of 7, and then it turns red at a neutral pH of 8. And so you can use that, um, excuse me, not a neutral pH, it turns red at a pH of 8, okay? So you can use phenol red to indicate when something gets more basic. The universal indicator is the one that covers the whole scale. And so it changes all of these different colors from 0 to 14 that we can use. And I mentioned this all the way back in concept one. Seven's kind of like a yellowish green, our neutral. And then we get more and more red as we move down the acidic scale. And we get more and more blue and purple as we move down the alkaline scale in terms of looking at the universal indicator, which we'll look at in class. Okay, the last thing I want to mention before we stop talking about acids and bases are titrations. And a titration is really important. It's a process of determining the molarity of an acid or base through the use of an acid or base reaction. So what we do is we use the molarity of one of the reactants, which we know, and we're going to use that to figure out the molarity of the unknown. And we can do this because, remember, in acid-base reactions, they neutralize. I mentioned that we can do the stoichiometry to figure out, like, how much acid do you need to neutralize this base or vice versa. And that's what we're kind of doing in the titration is figuring that out. So here's kind of what we see happened. Okay, so you will have something, you know, in your flask. Like, let's say we have hydrochloric acid in there and we don't know its concentration. You'll add an indicator, like phenol phthalene, Okay. You'll put a strong base like sodium hydroxide in something called a burette, and it has a stopcock which releases really small amounts of the base at a time. 
and you'll add tiny amounts until that indicator changes color to indicate you've reached a certain concentration. And then we can use that to calculate. So the a titration is just the controlled addition and measurement of the amount of solution of known concentration required to react completely with a measured amount of a solution with an unknown concentration. So if you're in my class, I don't have the equipment to do this, so we won't actually be doing one with the burette and everything, but I want you to at least know what it is. If you're in a different class, you might be actually doing one. So um, we are now gonna look at some acid-base reactions and kind of practice that and make sure we understand and we can identify what's involved and what's going on.